God's eye is on the sparrow and on each of us. And I want to acknowledge that this morning we gather uh, with heavy hearts, hearts of grief and sadness, hearts of frustration and outrage at yet another incident of mass violence and lives lost senselessly. I want to acknowledge that. And I want to acknowledge that this has also been a weekend of great celebration for many graduates. And last weekend, too, was a weekend of celebration and teachers wrapping up a school year. And we live in that tension, don't we? Not just one or the other, but that tension. And I think our God asks us to be present to both while not getting lost in either one. And we'll say more about that as we move into this service, but let me now say welcome. A welcome to you. And a very special welcome to visitors and guests and a welcome back to those who haven't been with us for a while. My name is Sarah Barasco, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And on behalf of all of our worship leaders this morning, we want to welcome you to this space, this space that has been carefully prepared for you. And while we'll be starting in this space, we're also going to move to our outdoor space, another space that has been carefully prepared, not just for you, but for many. And it's an exciting moment today that we will celebrate and we will bless and dedicate that space. So as much for me as it is for you, let's just take a moment to breathe. Just take a moment to arrive. Many of us are back at masks, so breathing feels different again. Allow yourself to settle in to the seat or the floor that's supporting you. Breathe in the breath of God and breathe out the love of God. Breathe in the breath of God and breathe out the love of God. And may these words rest gently upon you no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey. You are welcome here. Our song that Robert began with this morning says, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. We also sing as a form of prayer. And that's what our first hymn is this morning, Healer of Our Every Ill. So I want to invite you to stand and please sing this prayer uh, as we continue in worship.
in days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised up above the hills. People shall stream to it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. God shall judge between many peoples and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. We're not there yet, are we? These words from Micah, if only. So my question this morning is, have we hit bottom yet? I mean, that's a 12-step question, if you're familiar with that program. It's also a question for gardeners. I'm a weed picker, and I like the challenge and the opportunity to be outside and to just putz around. And when I see a weed spring up, it gives me great delight to pluck it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. Weed pickers know that the best time to pluck up a weed is when? After the rain, after a storm, when the ground is more vulnerable. How vulnerable are we right now? This is a good time to pluck up some weeds or some teachings that may be growing inside us that may not be life-giving. What's amazing to me sometimes is that what's on the surface can look so small. And what comes up, especially lately, I've been picking up things that resemble like carrots and turnips. And then there's like this other web of roots, much more delicate, but there. I was going to bring one in, but you know what it looks like. Beth and I have a neighbor. His name is Bupinder, and he grew up in India. And he saw me picking the weeds, and he said, you know, people told us we should pick the weeds, and I did pick them, but they came back. And he was genuinely surprised. He thought it would be a one and done. It is not. Especially not if you just pick the leaves, right? Or the tops. Mowing doesn't do it. In fact, our first lawnmower barely cut grass. So we'd just lay it down and then it would spring up. That doesn't work. Friends, to state the obvious, The sickness of violence is a weed, a toxic weed. And it's part of this country's origin story. It's framed by some, the origin story that is, it's framed by some as heroism and noble pursuit, even ordained by God. I would never ask you to praise or worship that God. And this narrative, this origin story narrative, has deep roots and offshoots that have expanded the battlefield. Now, I'm a daughter of the American Revolution, not an official member, but I do qualify through my mother. And I remember going to those reenactments. They were so neat and tidy, just a little piece of parcel of land. Looked like it was all happening on a soccer field. It was not in real life, I guess. 
but I grew up thinking that. Did anyone else think that battlefields were contained? All right, it's just me. But still, imagine growing up thinking that battlefields were contained. But even now, even that naive vision, even now if you were to say, no, of course they're not contained, but there seemed to have been boundaries. And now there's like no out of bounds. Supermarkets, schools, movie theaters, nail salons, worship spaces, public parks. You're probably naming more now in your head. Has bec- they, these places have become battlegrounds. It doesn't have to be this way. Have we hit bottom yet? Meaning, have we reached a level of discomfort and admission of illness that we are willing to work for a new way? Meaning, are we willing to examine our participation in the offshoot of the illness? Are we willing to act with courage? These are hard questions. These are after the candles questions. After the candles are lit and after the prayers are offered, these are the questions that we must wrestle with. We have begun wrestling with that here at UCC Longmont with our gun safety ministry. It's not just about guns, but it's a part of it. Our military has expanded too to civilian life where military grade weapons are available to civilians. That's crazy. Not just the style of weapons, but the magazines. Who needs that firepower? This is not an anti-hunting message. This is not a going to the range, anti-going to the range message. This is a, does not even our military have boundaries now? You know, when you play sports, when you finish a season, you turn in your uniform. How do we help people to turn in the mentality that you need a gun to be safe? And that your vow to protect and to serve does not require that you remain militant in your home and your neighborhood. How do we do that? Can we do that together? So for every candle we light, let's let's turn in an assault rifle. Let's turn in a high magazine holder, whatever those things are called. Let's go to the city council. They can make local decisions now. It's going to take some courage. You know, I was at Silver Creek High School graduation yesterday in the The teacher who was chosen to speak, I don't remember his name right now, but he said, you know, it's ironic. I'm up here and I'm supposed to impart some wisdom to you, some learned experience. And he said, as an adult, I think we have failed you. So I can understand why, well, at least I can understand the irony of here I am speaking to you as an adult. And he said, you need to be more courageous than some of the adults have been. And we clapped, and I clapped, and then I said, wait a minute. Yes, they do, but we need to be more courageous too. And we'll do that in the days and weeks to come. We'll have opportunities to do that, and you may think of some ways yourself, and I hope you do. Today... We're going to acknowledge some of the roots of violence of this nation's, on this nation's land. The losses of life and homelands before the Civil War. And as you listen, please consider 
what the land has witnessed over the years. We get very, let's think now as the land, if that's possible. What has the land witnessed over the years, not just here in this country, but throughout the world? And Edwina and Vicki have prepared some remarks for us to help us in our consideration of what's happened on this land. Many of you may not know that southern and western Colorado were previously part of Spain, then Mexico, before becoming Colorado. On February 2nd, 1848, the United States and Mexico signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, putting an end to the two-year Mexican-American War. Mexico gave the U.S. about 950,000 square miles, nearly half of its land mass, in exchange for peace. The United States essentially took the land by force. The land of Mexico was eventually partitioned into Colorado, New Mexico, California, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and other states. Nearly 80,000 Mexican citizens lived in this area. The treaty was meant to protect their property and civil rights, but Congress weakened the treaty that guaranteed their rights. The land was the greatest issue. Past land grants with individual plots and communal areas for grazing, hunting, and gathering were denied by American law. And in my own family in the San Luis Valley, that was history that was passed on to all the generations with, with great uh, strength of memory that land was taken away. Communal lands were lost, impoverishing communities and families. In the 1960s and 70s, Chicano activists fought for access to the communal lands. In 2002, Activists in the San Luis Valley were successfully, successfully gained access to some of the communal lands. Descendants of the original Mexican citizens live in the U.S. today and in Longmont, contributing to the life and culture of our community. In the Latino community, we say, we did not cross the border, the border crossed us. Today we have an opportunity to acknowledge and remember those who came before us on this land and recognize and honor the land on which we live and play. Many nations have walked this land and their descendants still walk among us. We acknowledge that we live in the territory of Arapaho and Cheyenne nations and that the Front Range is home to the Ute and many other indigenous nations. These people never believed that they could own the land. They believed that they were simply caretakers of the land for future generations. Native people share and honor and were the original stewards of all that Mother Earth provides. Food for the people, medicines and ceremonies, water which is sacred to life. They honor women as the carriers of knowledge and honor the infinite wisdom of the grandfathers. Native peoples continue to protect our land and water, maintain cultural traditions and practices, and contribute in immeasurable ways to our society today. We give thanks and honor today on this Memorial Day Sunday, the first people who walked where you now walk and live for protecting and being stewards of the land since the beginning of time.
Abraham Joshua Heschel is known to have said, some are guilty, but all are responsible. And what we're responsible for is what comes next. And so in that spirit of a willingness to consider what comes next, and with the courage to confess what has been, I invite you to join in this prayer of confession as it's written in your bulletin and as it will appear on your screen. O great spirit, God of every people and every nation, we ask for your forgiveness and guidance. Forgive us for the colonialism that stains our past and the entitlement that allows some to think that another's home could be claimed as their own. Help us to confront the racism that divides us as we acknowledge the pain it has caused and causes still to the human family. Call us to kinship and heal us. Mend the hoop of our hearts and guide us in your ways of justice, peace, and presence. And let us continue in a few moments of silence. Let's see what the Spirit will do with us.
Now, please join me in the statement of faith with the understanding that it might not be a statement of faith that we all have, but it's a statement of faith that we might live into or that we might wrestle with. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are all called to the church to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God.
if you were not familiar with the first reading this morning, that came from the prophet Micah, and that was chapter 4. And now, listen to these words from chapter 6, the first verse. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. The land does serve as witness to all that has been, all that is, and all that will be. Those were my words, not scripture. And so we turn now to chapter, to verse eight, which is familiar to this congregation because of Micah Holmes. God has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does God require of you but to do justice to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. And in that spirit of humility, with the land as our witness, we're going to move outside for a time of blessing and dedication. And just to give you a little orientation, the folks on this half of the sanctuary, you're going to go over to Parker, who's going to have handbells for you, and he'll give you instruction. And folks, on this side, we're going to invite you to also go out, but you're going to turn left, and you're going to go to a prayer flag station, and Beth and Phyllis will give you instruction there. So please go as you are able, take your time, and we'll continue outside. 